Well, yeah, welcome everybody. Normally, it's time to play the video, obviously, if you guys come to us in prayer and stuff. But that's me and Kevin. Thanks for having me. Good day. I'm going back. Well, let's just turn it off because I have one. Okay, that's good. Anyway, now that broke the train of thought, I'd do that would have hurt me if I hadn't have done that. But anyway, but anyway, we, we had, I hope y'all enjoyed the video. Uh, I'll come across it just a couple days ago. And, uh, well, I wish all of you happy Mother's Day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer so we can, we can make sure we get back on track. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the beautiful sunshine day you've given us, even though we have some clouds high up blocking the sun right now. We still pray and thank you for, for the beautiful day that you gave us. Any day we can come and worship together is a pretty day, is a good day, is a blessed day, is a beautiful day. We're looking at a mother that's in scripture who was faithful and to do the things that she needed to do. And she still cried out to God to finally to, to, to give her a son. And God was faithful and just, and he did. And unlike so many of us, that when God does what we call out to him to do, when he does it, we, find, we try to find a way to get out of it. Because we said, we'll do this if you do that. And he does what he's supposed to do. And we try not to do what, we want, what he wants us to do. The Lord God, we pray for all these ones here, their mothers back home, their wives, their girlfriends. We pray that they have the best day. We lift each and every one of them up to you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, we're talking about Hannah today. That's important. We'll find that in 1 Samuel chapter 1. She was a, she was a righteous woman according to Scripture. She was married to this man named Elkaniah. And she was the first first wife. You can tell she was the first wife because she didn't have any kids. She, didn't, she was barren. Her womb was closed up. So Elk and I married another woman, and she was she was fruitful. She took the word fruitful and multiplied to heart. She had kids just every every nine months, I guess, the way the scripture talks about it. And uh, but let's look at look at what we've got here. You know, Hannah was the mother of Samuel who had, had several distinctions in his life. And if, if any of us could have a mother like Hannah and make a vow to God like she did, with the results that she had, it would be amazing. But this is this is just a couple of things that Sam, uh, Samuel had done in his lifetime. He was an answer to fervent prayer of a righteous woman who was barren, Hannah. He was a gift from an omnipotent God, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. He was brought up in the tabernacle of God at Shiloh by the prophet, uh, by the priest Eli. He was the last judge of Israel. He was the first prophet of the Lord. He was the one who anointed the first king of Israel, failed King Saul. He was chosen by Yahweh to anoint the young shepherd boy who would replace the failed King Saul. King David is the root from which the Messiah, Christ Jesus, came sprang. Now James, the half-brother of the Lord, says in James 5, 16b, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. But I'm here to tell you, the prayers of a righteous woman avail much also. And Hannah proved that. Her only goal in life was to bring a son into this world, fulfilling her perceived purpose. And that was in an ancient world. But if a woman didn't have children, she didn't have much of a purpose in life because her only purpose was to have children. And though Elkanah loved her the best because she was, she was his first love, he still took a second wife. And we'll look at, look at the implications of this here as we go through Scripture. But First Samuel 1, 1 and 2 says, Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkaniah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, and an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, 
And the name of the other, Penaliah. Penaliah had children, but Hannah had no children. So that's the crux of the problem for Hannah right there. And you'll see as we go through the scripture that Penaliah was not a, not a nice lady. She was vindictive. Elkanah loved Hannah the best, and he, he favored her more than he did Penaliah, even though Penaliah was giving him all the kids. And I guess Penaliah perceived that she was second, second best in Elkanah's eyes, so she took every opportunity she had to get under Hannah's skin that she had no children. But Ramathal Zophim is another name for Ramal, and I'm so glad that they had another name for it. But the village was about five miles north of Jerusalem. The mountain of Ephraim refers to the hill country primarily occupied by the tribe of Ephraim. Now Elkanah, whose Hebrew name means God has created, was a Levite. He's referred to as an Ephraimite since he lived in the territory of Ephraim. One of the hardest things for a woman to endure in ancient Israel or anywhere in the ancient world was to be barren in marriage. Making matters worse, there were two wives. One, Penaniah, who was very fruitful. It made little difference. The husband loved and favored Hannah more than he did Penaniah. Hannah felt as though she were cursed. Now, now, I will say one thing about Hannah. She's like most of us. We go to pray to God. We, we do everything we can do. You know, we take put a raw egg under your pillow so you make you more fertile. You, and I'm not saying they did that. That's just my example. But you do things, whatever silly thing you can do, think of, that somebody might tell you that will, will take care of the problem. When all that fails, you say, well, I've come to the last straw. I guess I have to pray and inquire of God to get him to intercede instead of saying, you know, i got a problem. I need to go to God to start with. We make it to last. Go from uh, a little thing to taking a miracle for it to happen. And that's where we are within. But Penn and I, she lorded it over Hamlet, making, making Hamlet's life unbearable. She was humiliated. She was just, it was horrible for her. She didn't have a happy day. And Elk and I could not understand why she didn't, what was it, life of father said, why didn't she didn't bunk up? You know, build up, build up herself. Why she wasn't happy? Well, she was happy enough at times, but she didn't have, she liked joy. She liked joy because she, she craved to have a son. But verse 3 and 5 says, This man, being up and I, went up from this, his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give a portion to Penaniah, his wife, and all of his sons, all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. He loved her no matter what. She was, she was his go-to wife. Penaniah was just a, a just a substitute for, for what Hannah, Hannah wanted to do. But Hannah, as I said, was probably the first and greatest love of Elkanah's life. It would have been difficult for him to be in this ancient world to have a wife who was barren. Now, when we look look at look at this this polygamy in the, in the Old Testament, it was under God's law. It was permissible. It wasn't things that God's law permits doesn't always mean it's desirable. And surely today we know that. Polygamy is against the law, and definitely against God's law, because He gave us the the marriage, the uh, formula for marriage in Genesis 2:24. He says, "Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh." Now, the thing that was a problem here was inheritances and uh, ge basically genealogies. 
it, if a man had a wife, didn't have any children, didn't have a son, then it was, daughters didn't count for much in the, in the first century. But if he didn't have a son to carry on the name, then that was a problem. And that's what the, in uh, the, the Old Testament, it was also a Levite Le 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 uh, vow, which was basically, if your brother dies without an issue, then what you do is you, you marry his, his wife so that she can have a son and carry on the family name, because if you don't, the name is lost. And that's the only reason that God even permitted it in the Old Testament is because it was crucial to keep the genealogies, keep the inheritances, keep the uh, tribes where the, the way they were supposed to be aligned. But the practice was permitted under God's law, particularly in cases of childless marriage. Now, Scripture says, and I'll get to it in a minute, Under extraordinary circumstances, polygamy was permitted. But King Solomon, which we'll look at, he, he abused the privilege. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. There was nobody needed that much of a headache. Nobody. But he, he, he sought it out, I guess. But God didn't reward him. God didn't say how he looked because your first 699 wives were barren, that seven hunts when she has, that didn't happen. And that, that, that was the difference. But as I said, the practice was permitted under God's law, particularly in cases of childless first marriage, or a lever right marriage, where, which was when the father and brother died without issue. In ancient Israel, failure to have children was regarded as a family tragedy for several reasons. In an agrarian culture, children were needed to help with the work of everyday life. Can you imagine having a big plot of land and not having uh, sons to help you work that land to, to, to till it? And that was built-in farm labor. But uh, that, that was reason, one reason it was permitted. But you didn't go out and get half a dozen women and have half a dozen sons and daughters and stuff and call that pleasing to God because it wouldn't be pleasing to him. But polygamy was not God's plan for the family under certain circumstances was acceptable. But without sons, the family name would not be preserved. This was not God's will for the marriage arrangement because he gave us the model in Genesis 2.24. We've already read that. But polygamy was not in Yahweh's plan for marriage and the family because he knew the problems. When we look at every instance in Scripture where there was polygamy involved, there was a problem. There's not one that wasn't a problem. Remember Abraham, Hagar, and Ishmael. That was a problem. Abraham went ahead of what God's Word said. Then we'll see this with Pen, Pen and I and Hannah, the things that was going on with that. But then you look at David. He had several wives, not because he had a barren wife. He had several wives because he wanted to have several wives. God overlooked it to a point. But I'm, I'm pretty sure he paid a penalty for, for the things he did. Because we never get away from Scott Free when we, when we go against what God wants. But just because the majority accepts sin does not mean that God's word on the subject is void. Difficulties always arise due to the division of loyalties and the problem of errors and inheritances. We just have to look, as I just said, to Abraham, Hagar, and Ishmael to see problems can arise from polygamy. Every time we try to help God out, we demonstrate a lack of faith. Poly Polygamy was an ancient, it was an accepted custom, but God's law warned rulers against marrying many women in Deuteronomy 17, 17. And this is what I was talking about a minute ago, when it was important to carry on the, the family name to, to, to help out. But just getting women so you can have a fresh, fresh one every day, that, that, that's not God's. God is not going to reward that. 
But Deuteronomy 17, 17 says, Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Now what happened, what is talking about, and we use uh, Solomon as an example, Solomon was, a, was King David's son by Bathsheba, and he was, he was started out okay. He didn't ask God to give him a bunch of money, a bunch of wealth, and a bunch of property and stuff. He just asked for wisdom. Why he give him that wisdom, I don't know. We have one incident in Scripture where two women came with one baby, and he, he, he worked that out. But other than that, he, was, I, he, he strikes me as an idiot. Anybody want to have that many wives, that many women would put claims on your time and stuff. Plus, he went from following God after building the temple to building places for, for, for the idol worship of his wives. That's, that's why in Scripture, in the New Testament especially, it says, don't be unequally yoked to unbelievers. Can you imagine the yoke he would have on him? He'd have a yoke around his neck with 700 extensions out there, not to mention the 300 concubines. That is not going to be, they're going to pull you that way. That's the whole purpose of being unequally yoked, or not being unequally yoked, is, is you'll go, and I know your marriage are anyway, we're not worried about that. The thing about it is, is we have somebody we really care about, we think a lot of them, and they're not a believer. We are, and we say, well, you know what? After they've been around me for a little while, they'll come over. What happens is it goes the other way. Instead of the, the believer bringing the unbeliever to Christ, the unbeliever drags the believer away. Now, they don't take your salvation away from somebody who's saved, but you take your, your service away, your gifts away, or whatever that you get the benefits of being a Christian. And that's why scripture says over and over again, do not be unequally up to an unbeliever in business, in marriage, in any relationship. That doesn't mean you ostracize them, but you don't marry them. You find one that God prepared for you. Samuel, 1 Samuel 1, 6 and 8 says, And her rival also provoked us severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was, year after year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkaniah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why, and why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Now Elkaniah loved Hannah, and he'd hoped his love and his affection and attention to her would be enough for her absent having a child, but it was not enough. It was, it was never going to be enough. But, ha but the happiness of being his wife and the joy of bearing him children, the son, could not be compared. She felt tormented by Penn and I, who bore many children. And I can see Penn and I now. Oop, here's another one. You know, she's just a, she was just a fruitful woman. And I believe that it, that was all in God's plan for all this to come to fruition, because none of that stuff catches God by surprise. Now, he'll wait on us to, to ask, to petition, but he's going to do what he's going to do. But she did. She felt tormented by Penn and I, who bore, as I said, many children. It was a burden she couldn't bear alone, so she inquired of the Lord. See, I don't know how many years, how many children Penn and I had from the time that... Uh, Hannah married Elk and I and didn't have any children. I don't know how, it didn't, the scripture doesn't tell us what the period of time is, how long that was. But it was several years because Penn and I had several children. But it was a burden, as I said, she couldn't bear alone anymore. So we go down to 1 Samuel 1, 9 through 11. It says, So Hannah rose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. 
Then she made a vow and said, O oh Lord of hosts, if you indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget, your maidservant will give you your <clears throat> but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Now Hannah finally petitioned the one who could help in all these things. She cried out to the Lord for Lord of hosts, which is a military title, because all were in submission to him. Now they may not think they are, but they're in submission to him. Even Satan, who thinks he's the king of the walk, he's under submission to God because he's like a puppy on the leash. No matter where he goes, if he goes too far, God snatches him back. And that's the way he is with us if we get out of line as believers. But she cried out to the Lord of hosts, as I said, which is a military term. She cried out to the one true living God. In her petition, she made a Nazarite vow to dedicate her son to God all the days of his life. Now, that, that, I, I guarantee you, my alma mater at the Thomas Road Baptist Church, right next to, to the university, they're, well, they're probably already finished by now, but they're, Three, the two times we were there for, for graduation, it was at uh, Mother's Day. I had about 300 families that brought babies up, dedicated them to the Lord. But they missed the point of what they were doing. They weren't dedicating the baby to the Lord as such. What they were doing was they were dedicating their time, their effort, their stu studi uh, study of God's Word to bring their children up in proper fear of the Lord, we can you know, dedicate, say, we want to dedicate this chair to the Lord. Well, that's not going to accomplish much unless we, we get over there, pick it up, and carry it to where he is. Of course, I, I'm not, I know the way to heaven through, through Jesus, but I don't know if we want to get from you there. But anyway, we dedicate children, as I said, to church when they're babies, but it doesn't do anything for the babies, it's, it's accountable upon us to bring them up in the proper fear of the Lord. I had it, I don't think I have it up here anymore. It says, basically, that the church, Sunday, if, we, if we depend on our children to go to the Sunday school, church service, children's church, or any of that, and was, and I can't think of anything else that they have, if we think that's what's going to bring them up, and we don't have to do anything, we just let the church do it. Then you're gonna, they're going to be lost. And when they get out in the world, they're going to be susceptible to any nonsense that comes along. That's why it's incumbent upon each one of us to bring our children up in the proper fear of the Lord. And when we fail to do that, we'll pay a penalty for that for a long time. But she was going to dedicate Samuel to the Lord all the days of Samuel's life. Well, when she said this was before Samuel was born, but she she vowed to God that if you give me a son, I'm going to give him back to you. But I want to have a son. In Samuel 1, 12 and 16 it says, and it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I'm a woman of sorrow spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Eli makes a mistake most of us make, which is to judge by appearance and not the heart. He rebuked her for being drunk rather than inquiring about the sister's problem. Eli was the high priest and the judge of Israel, and as such should have been more discerning. He should have been more discerning and responsive about the obvious torment of Hannah. 
But he couldn't even identify the wickedness of his own sons. So it was any wonder he missed Hannah's need. You know, often, often we, we, do, we do things that we think we're helping somebody, but we're not. Or um, we look. Now, there's a guy that stands on the side of the road, kind of raggy looking, got a monocular sign. But I always wonder who that Tesla sitting off the side of the road, who, who that belongs to. You know, if, I, if he had time to stay, just sit around somewhere and watch and see if he put a sign up, folded the sign up, went dust the seat off, and got in that Tesla and drove off. But, um, you know, we, we make that judgment. That could have been anybody's Tesla. It didn't necessarily have to be his. He could be down and out. He could be uh, destitute. But we don't know. And sometimes we just make a value judgment. Yeah, okay, we don't need to mess with him. It's a good thing that the Good Samaritan didn't do that with the, the man who, who fell among thieves. Now, Eli understands that he intercedes with God for Hannah's petition. But as I said, aren't we glad that through the shed blood of Christ, we have a we are a priesthood of believers. Now in Matthew 27:51 it says, and this is one one of the least quoted verses in Scripture, but I think it's one of the most important in the New Testament. It says, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, the earth quaked and rocks were split. The reason I say this is important is because up until the point that Jesus went to the cross, when he died on the cross, that that's when the veil of the temple was turned torn from top to bottom. What that did was that took the last barrier between man and God. Before, before the crucifixion, you had to take a, a spotless animal to have it sacrificed. You had to do it, and you couldn't. All it said about the, the Hebrews, they needed to be prayed up, uh, sacrificed up, and everything, because as soon as, as soon as that was done, they'd walk out and saw some lady with a dress, you could see her ankle almost, and they'd, they'd have lusted after her, and then they'd have to start all over again. But because of the cross, that veil was torn in half from top to bottom, which symbolizes from God to us, we don't have to go to a priest anymore. You don't have to come to me to pray for I would gladly pray for you, don't get me wrong. But you don't have to come to me to pray for you. You can go directly directly to God yourself and pray to him and entreat him. And that's the that's the difference before and after because what happened with the old system before that veil was torn, that was the uh, veil to the Holy of Holies. The priest, the high priest that year, was the only one who could go in there on the Day of Atonement. He had to be sacrificed up, he had to be prayed up, he had to be everything. He had to be clean as he could be. Because if he went in there and there was a spot of sin on him, then he would he would be dead. They would they had a bell on him, so they'd ring that bell, keep that bell going. You know that song, ring that bell? Well, that's what he did, but he tied a rope around him. Because if he went in there and something wasn't right, God struck him dead, they would drag him out with that rope. When that bell quit ringing, they would start dragging him out with that rope. Then they would look for the associate pastor to get him to go in there. But uh, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Because we have an advocate that we can go directly to and pray, pray, and to him. First Samuel 1, 19 and 20 says, Then they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife. And we all know what in the Bible knew means, right? I don't have to spell it out. And the Lord remembered her. Now when it says remembered, it's not like God's walking, oh, man, I forgot about Hannah. I, I, she prayed. It was not like that. It just meant that the time had come to hit its perfect timing for her, her to conceive. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah did conceive and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, 
because I have asked for him from the Lord. Now the Lord is faithful to answer prayers of a righteous person. Samuel in Hebrew means God is heard. He answered Hannah's prayer in a way that his provision could not be questioned. How many barren women blessed by Jehovah Jireh would honor their covenant, would still honor a vow to the Lord who provides to give that miracle son to the same Lord for life. Hannah was faithful to, to her vow and never relented in giving Samuel to the service of the Lord. Now this is the thing, and I, I've touched on it. That, that guy on the side of the road, he's, we'll, we'll, for the sake of argument, this, this story, he, he's down and out. He's, he's got nothing. He doesn't have that Lexus over there or that Tesla. He prays, uh, prays to God, says, you know, God, I'm, I'm at the bottom. I, I don't have anything. I'm just dependent on you. And God says, well, you know what? Let's send a guy that runs McDonald's over there to down the street to offer him a job. And the guy, the guy comes in and offers, offers him a job, and he takes it. The guy says, here, I'm going to give you some money. You get cleaned up and stuff and come back to work. The guy gets cleaned up, comes, comes to work at McDonald's, and he does good. He does so good, he, start, he, he gets his own franchise, and he's got a half a dozen franchises, and he, he, he's, real, and he's getting rich. He's got money all, all over the place. And somebody say, uh, well, how did you, how did you get, go from rags to riches? How did you do this? So, well, you know, I'll tell you what, it was hard work. It was hard work. So, I, you know, I did it on my own, but I was down and out. I never says, you know, when I was down and out, I cried out to God to, to rescue me, to, to bring me to where, where I needed to be. And he did. And I give all the glory to God, but we take it ourselves. We take the glory and we take it upon ourselves because once God does what we ask him to do, all of a sudden we think, well, we did it ourselves. Now Leviticus 12, 6 says something. We're still talking about, well, let's see. Yeah, go to 21, next slide. Verse 21 of Samuel 1 says, uh, Now the man Elkanah and all his house have went up to offer the, to the Lord really sacrifice in his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she had said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So what we're looking at is she's had Samuel. Most people say, well, you said you're going to give him to the Lord, take him down there now, but you don't want to take a baby to, to, for, for you ought to take care of. You want to take a, a toddler, at least a, a small child. But she said, I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm going to stay here until this boy is weaned. And this is what it said. Leviticus 12, 6 says, When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb in the first year, of the first year as a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now, she didn't do that because she didn't want to present him. She wanted that, that boy, Samuel, she wanted to give him the best start she could before she turned him over to Eli. She was doing everything she could to make his life successful, but she was not reneging or even trying to renege on her, her vow to, to take him. But she didn't present him as a custom dictator because she wanted him to have the best possible start. Her vow to dedicate Samuel to the Lord would be kept, but at the most opportune time for the child. The most opportune time ensures the greatest service to Yahweh. Now, 1 Samuel 1, 23 and 24 says, So Elkanah, Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have him wounded. Only let the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until he was weaned, until she weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, she took him with her with three bulls, one ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. 
Now, you see the difference in what was required at the time of her purification. If she, a son or daughter, she was supposed to bring just a spotless lamb. But she, she went overboard. She, she made sure. She brought three bulls, an ephah of flour, a skin of wine. She was bringing the best sacrifice for that child she could bring. But the mother honored her vow. She presented her miracle son to the Lord, made the proper sacrifices and praise and worship to the Lord who provides. She did all a mother could do to make sure she kept her vow to the Lord and provided the best, the best foundation for her young son's life of service to, to Yahweh. Now, 1 Samuel 1, 25-28 says, Then they slaughtered a bull, brought the child to Eli, and she said, O oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and he has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore I have also lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshiped the Lord there. Now Hannah explains that Eli, to Eli that his child is the same she was petition the Lord for at the tabernacle. She professed that she vowed to give him to the Lord all the days of his life. When she says, lend him to the Lord, it carries a different connotation than we give it today. Because when we talk to somebody, you say, hey, can you lend me lend me some money? I say, yeah, okay. And when I say, you said, I'll lend you that money. Do you go pay it back? But that's not what it means in here. It means for all time. And that's what she did. She gave them to the Lord for all times. The Hebrew word translated Lent means giving for all time and just not for a time. They all bowed down and worshiped for the only one who is worthy of our worship, Jehovah Jireh. Truly, he is the Lord who provides the way where there is none. Hannah had a husband who loved her more than any other, but her need was for a son. She did all she could do to make it happen, but knew it would never happen absent the Lord's intervention. Her vow was if Yahweh gave her a son, she would give him to the Lord for the entirety of his life. After the boy was weaned, and she presented him to the Lord and gave his care and upbringing to Eli. How often, and I always picture this in my mind, how often do you think that she went, she only lived five miles from Shiloh, Every time she got the chance to walk up there, she looked behind the building or behind the corner of the tent at the tabernacle, looking to see how, how that baby Samuel was doing, how that little boy was doing. She was a proud mama, and she had every right to be proud, because Samuel was a, was a fine man in his scripture. Of many biblical characters we read about, you don't read about Samuel having a bunch of personality flaws and character flaws. And he, he was fruitful to the Lord. He did, did the Lord's bidding. He did everything he was asked to, plus more. But how often do we cry to God and, and vow to do something in service to him if only he does for us first? So that's the key. We, we want God to do for us first because if he does for us first, then maybe maybe we can slide out and not, not really do anything. But if we say, well, we'll do this first if you do that, then we're, we're obligated and we'll do something. We won't try to talk him out of it. But that, that's, that's the human, humanity of us, as we constantly think, well, we either did it ourselves, we, we asked God to help, but I just figured out a way to do it myself, or any, anything, but anything to, to rob the glory from God. But let's review the things as, of Samuel. We talked about him at the beginning. He was an answer to fervent prayer of a righteous woman who was barren. He was a gift from the omnipotent God, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. He was brought up in the tabernacle of God by the high priest Eli. He was the last judge of Israel. He was the first prophet of the Lord. He was the one who anointed the first king of Israel, King Saul. He was chosen by Yahweh to anoint the young shepherd boy who replaced the failed King Saul. King David was the root from which the Messiah, Christ Jesus, sprang. Again, James, the half-brother of the Lord, says in James 5, 16b, 
And the effective fervent prayers of a righteous man avails much, but also the fervent prayers of a righteous woman avails much also. Samuel had a pretty strong resume for service to Yahweh. But we never have paid much attention to Hannah. Has she not petitioned the Lord? How much do you do you want to bet? As I said, she was looking around the corner, peeking around to see how the boy was doing. Now, Miss Terry is going to lead us in the song of invitation after we do it to close in prayer. But the church, and this, this is something that really needs to touch people's hearts. The church does not determine what the Bible teaches. The Bible determines what the church teaches. And we, we just looked at it. I mean, it, well, we won't go into it. It's, it's not the time and place. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this beautiful day you gave us for Mother's Day. We, we pray for all the mothers here. We pray for Miss Terry, who's my son's mother. And we lift them all up to you. We pray they have a good, blessed day. But Lord God, we give you praise and glory for all the things you did. The story of Hannah is touching because what happens is we don't give her, her much in this, but the whole thing was about her faithfulness. And yes, she, she struggled and did many things up for a period of time, but Lord, ultimately she came to you and cried out to you for, for relief. And you were faithful to relieve her and give her a son, Samuel. And Samuel served you mightily for many years. But Lord God, we need to, we, we vow to you to do something for us, and you do it. We need to, we need to carry through and do what we say we're going to do. We, we don't need to just cast you aside after you do what, what you, we want you to do. We need to be faithful to you as you're faithful to us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.